difference between believing something to be true and being able to prove that that something is indeed true. It may be that you believe in the existence of God. You might believe in the existence of God so strongly that you are willing to sacrifice your life for your belief. But that does not, in fact, prove that there is such a thing as God. On the other hand, failure to be able to prove that there is such a thing as God does not in itself prove that there is not such a thing as God. Most of the things in life you can't prove. I mean, you may have read them in a book and you may trust the author of that book and you might read them in you know, a scientific journal and you may trust the author of that journal, but that does not in fact prove that that journal was correct. I came right out of the gate here with the biggie, the existence of God. There are a lot of other issues in our society right now that we fight about. Red versus blue. What to do with the January 6th hearings? How do we handle living in a COVID uh, reality? These are things and many others like them that are hot points in our society where we're almost at each other's throats. And I would like to say that that is not true of the church, but I can't say that. We as Christians are as influenced by the prevailing winds of society as anyone else. And we disagree vehemently with each other about those very issues that I've just mentioned. So how can we apply some sort of critical thinking to help us make more sense out of this world and our place in this world? One of the simplest and most common forms of critical thinking is simply the generalization. That is, uh, you're confronted with some problem, some issue, and you kind of look back through your mind, you know, go through your memory banks and, and you find an illustration, an example that matches the current problem and you do it the same way again, fix the problem. For instance, someone that is dealing with a particular uh, health pro issue, someone else that's dealt with that health issue in the past might be able to understand more what they're going through better than someone that has never dealt with it before. Or, or here's an example I used last night. Let's say um, a few days from now, your next door neighbor comes over and says, my dog's been scratching. What do you think's wrong? I mean, is it starting to get a, it's a bald spot there? And you might think back and you might say, oh, well, a few years ago, one of my dogs was doing that and it turned out to be fleas. And so we solved it with a flea dip and some flea treatments. And so your neighbors, thinks, well, yeah, maybe that's it, so I'll give it a try. That, that's just about as simple and easy of critical thinking as possible. Now, it does not prove anything. It doesn't prove the dog's got fleas. The dog could uh, have a nervous condition and be nervously scratching. The dog could have dry skin and could be scratching because there are lots of reasons that a dog could be scratching, but this is a, a possibility. Now, if you had two or three other illustrations, examples that uh, might strengthen your possibilities, your conclusion a little bit, you might say, you know, a couple of years ago, one of my dogs was scratching and it turned out to have fleas. And my brother's dog, a couple of years ago, it was scratching, it turned out to be fleas. And one of the people that go to the church with, with us, uh, they said their dog was doing that and it had fleas. Well, now you've got three examples of the same thing and that strengthens the case. It does not prove that dog has fleas, but it does strengthen the case that's a, that that's a possibility. And it gives some sort of suggestion on what to do, try a flea dip. Now, the more examples that we find, the stronger the argument. Now, we can't find enough examples to prove the argument, 
but that is with beyond a, a possibility of being wrong, but we can find enough examples to make a strong argument. Um, for instance, perhaps I found a thousand dogs, or perhaps I went knocking on every door in our community, in our, in our town, and I asked them, has your dog ever scratched? Um, has your dog ever had fleas? What do you do about it? And if we went to every dog in town, the owners, and we ask every one of them, and we found out that every dog in town has been scratching and has fleas, we might think there is a flea infestation, and we probably would be right, but we have not proved it yet, because it could still be a nervous condition, it could still be dry skin, it could still be an allergic reaction to something. There are other things it could still be, but we've made a really powerful case. <laughs> that makes sense. Now, some place between my dog had fleas and I went knocking on every door in town, there's got to be some way that we could take kind of a random sampling of the dogs just all over town and different conditions and find enough, maybe a hundred dogs or something, and find enough to make our evidence really conclusive. Not a hundred percent, but really strong. When we get to that realm, we're talking about statistics. Statistics can be a very powerful tool. Unfortunately, statistics can also be a very powerful tool to disseminate false information and to trick people. We see those figures, we see the numbers pop up on the screen and or, or come across the news report and we think, aha, you know, we can get our teeth around that. We, we've got some ammunition for our point of view or for their point of view. And it may be totally dishonest. Let's play a little game. How to lie with statistics. But what about if I decided I want to start an insurance company? And I said something like, um, oh, the average savings of people that switched from their insurance company to my insurance company was $475 a year. That could be an honest thing. But within saying that, you know, the average savings of people that switched from their insurance company to my insurance company was $475 a year, I did not say, what about the people that didn't switch? It may be that there are a thousand people out there that would have found my insurance company too high priced and they didn't switch. And there were a couple of people out there that did find that it was safer. Maybe for some reason their insurance company was jacked up. They'd had accidents before or something. And so they switched over and they found out that mine uh, was cheaper and so we just don't count that thousand we count the couple and the small group and we can proudly go on tv and say that the average savings of people that switched to my insurance company was 475 dollars a year you think that happens listen closely to the advertisements okay how to lie with statistics let's try another one what about the bias that is inherent inside the samples that we pick, the examples we pick for our, um, for our study? Sometimes, for instance, self-selecting studies aren't worth anything. And yet, how many times have we seen those? You go on the internet and it wants to take a, a poll. How many people feel this way? How many people feel that way? Well, every person that takes, or should never say every, the majority, vast majority of the people that take that kind of a survey are people that are already opinionated on sites that are already opinionated uh, that direction. And so they, they come out with a twist to them. I mean, not very many people spend a lot of time going on the internet, taking surveys just for the sake of taking surveys in subjects that they're not interested in. I have, I don't think I have ever gone on the internet and taken a survey about snorkeling off the coast of Florida. I don't think so. Never snorkeled off the coast of Florida. 
But if you throw a survey in my hands about something that I'm more interested in, something religious, something you know like that, I, I'm more likely to answer it. But it's also likely to be biased. So the way we write the survey and the way we present the survey and who gets invited to be a part of our survey is a way that we can lie with statistics. Which, by the way, when I get political surveys in the mail, they seem to come from people that think they know how I'm going to vote already. So if I fill out one of those surveys and send it back in, I'm kind of reinforcing a view that they're looking at me to reinforce. That may be convincing to some people, but it's not a, a very honest survey. By the way, while we're talking about the bias of the people that are surveyed, the, the groups that we use to get our examples from, why don't we mention the bias of those that are putting on the survey? They're not like doing that by accident, flubbing it up. When was the last time that you heard a conservative survey and study where the conservatives did their study and they said, oh my goodness, we're wrong. We, we need to switch to the other side because we, we got this thing all wrong. Or when was the last time that, I want to be fair here on both sides, that you heard a progressive study and the progressives after they did the study, those that were doing it said, oh my goodness, we're wrong. We need to be more conservative on this one. I, I mean, it must happen. And there have to be times where people are wrong unless they're just incredibly gifted and get everything proper and right the first time. But when was the last time that somebody disproved their major political theme or idea with a study, a survey, or something like that? So you have to kind of ask yourself, if there are all these figures and facts and surveys and populations and, and, and figures and numbers coming out and being thrown at us all the time, and yet nobody ever repudiates themselves, how much bias is there in the, um, <laughs> in the modus operandi, in the way, the method of their research, huh? <laughs> Lying with statistics, quite a big subject, isn't it? I, I think that we can go on and on and on and on. So I'll just do a couple more. But, but what about when you switch percentages and numbers? Okay, here's what I mean. Be very careful whenever in the same, uh, in the same study, the same advertisement, they switch, and so much percentage of this uh, thought this way, and so many people jump this way. Well, whenever you jump however many people compared to what percentage of the population, you're comparing apples with oranges, and you can twist that to look really good. My wife likes these little pot pies, and I don't know how many calories they have. I know in the front of this one particular pot pie that you, you bake, you stick in the oven or microwave for nine minutes, come out and eat. On the front of it, on one of them, it says so much sodium or whatever it is, so much this, whatever it is, and so many calories. Okay, now on the front, if you look at it carefully with the small print, so much sodium per pie, so much this per pie, so much calories per serving, which uh, is, they're written all together. They all look the same. It, it assumes that the calories, you know, for the whole pie, just like it's everything else for the whole pie. You look on the back and it tells you that one serving is one half of a pot pie. So really what they're saying is so much of this, so much of this, so much of this, and double the calories of what we have listed here on the front in big letters. That, that's just one example. And they're, you know, go check it out for yourself at a grocery store. And the last one that I'm going to use is counter examples. If a person is talking about a serious subject with another person, uh, whether it be gun control, whether it be religion and, and religious beliefs, whether it be a political type, other types of issues or, or COVID or, you know, the um, January 6th hearings or, or all those things we fight about. 
whenever people are in a serious discussion about that and someone brings up a statistic, a point, an example, and someone else brings up in good faith another example that they wrestle with, and if that the first person finds that defensive and they have to get um, angry about it, they have to raise their voice about it, they have to bring in other examples, they have to defeat the first first person or the person that brought the counterexample, you're not in a fair discussion. Let me um, finish off by just asking a, a fairly serious question. The things we're talking about today, they're not typical devotion subjects. I'm not doing a typical Bible study. What we're doing on Tuesday nights is not a typical Bible study, but it's also not something that's taught a lot anymore. I mean, when we talk about STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, critical thinking is not part of those disciplines. It's more in the humanities, more in the philosophy department. And even if it was taught a lot in our colleges, a lot of people don't go to college. They go to other kinds of schools, the trade schools, and, and so a lot of this is not taught. A lot of the really tough, nitty-gritty subjects we fight over are a little bit hot for grade school and for high school, or at least for students to be able to talk back and, and flesh out their ideas. So I was thinking, where is this stuff questioned now? Where is this stuff taught? I thought to myself, what if every church in the country were to sit down with their people and just have some honest, long discussions about critical thinking and how to weed out things that are honest from things that are dishonest, how to weed out truth from propaganda? What if all of our churches began to teach this sort of thing in addition to the other things that we bring up? Kind of fill in the gap a bit. Would it make a difference? Well, we have a few more days left in the week ahead. This is Wednesday. We started this discussion at the church last night on Tuesday. We have a few days before we come together again on Sunday to worship together. And, and during those few days, we're going to be confronted with all sorts of generalizations and examples and arguments and uh, statistics. May God give you the clarity to weed out fact from fiction.